This is Earth. There's Venus, Mercury, and the Sun. Now, even though Mercury is twice as close to the Sun as Venus, Venus is the hotter planet. Why? Carbon dioxide, a.k.a. CO2. Venus's atmosphere is full of CO2, and the greenhouse effect has run amok. Since the Industrial Revolution, Earth's CO2 levels have been increasing sharply, and now we, too, are heating up. Granted, Earth's been hotter before and colder, but it's been about the same temperature for the last 10,000 years, which includes all of modern human achievement, like farming, vinyatas, and frequent flyer miles. Climate change is happening. Is it fixable? What are the solutions? Who's working on this? There are truly problems that we can't solve. We don't yet have the cure to cancer. We don't yet have the cure for Alzheimer's. We don't yet have the cure for Parkinson's disease. This problem we can solve, and there's no good reason not to, and so much is at stake. On check, global warming threatens to drive into extinction one out of every two creatures on the face of the Earth. The Arctic could literally disappear in 10 years' time. We're going to see serious disruption of agriculture. Huge sea level rises. Millions fleeing to higher ground. More extreme storm events. Wildfires. More periods of drought. Ethnic conflicts. Potential decline and collapse of civilization. I've heard enough. I'm convinced. I don't need to hear any more about we're all doomed. We know it's a big task. But it's also a fantastic and huge opportunity. The U.S. has about 5% of the world's people, but we create almost a quarter of the world's CO2. CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas, it's just the one making the most trouble right now. A lot of people worry about climate change, but a third of Americans don't think humans are the cause. We agree with the 84% of scientists, groups of faith like the Evangelical Climate Initiative, many Fortune 500 companies, and the Pentagon. That's right, the Department of Defense. These groups know humans are the cause and that this is a big, big problem. Figuring out whether tackling climate change is possible is the big question. To get the job done, we'd better find people who are giving it the good fight and hope the next generation is up to the task. There is a big stumbling block. Today, there's no cost for emitting CO2. No penalty for the downside of carbon-based energy. And that makes it hard to move people to clean energy. Now back to those scientists. It's important to note that many times they've been wrong with their climate models. Global warming is happening much faster than any of them predicted. And that woke us up. So we hit the road, hunting, hoping for solutions. Our first stop, wind. Wind is a renewable resource. It also renews lives. In Pennsylvania's rejuvenated rust belt, laid-off steel workers are now hired to make turbines. And down in West Texas, wind is turning dirt into gold. Are you getting lots of wind noise here? Just that's supposed to be, you know, that's supposed to fit right in the picture, wind noise and yeah. on the wind farm. <laughs> Cliff saw wind turbines popping up all around his cotton farm and decided to get a piece of the action before it blew away. All of the developers that I approached initially were accustomed to doing business in the large ranches. Lots of land, one or two owners. 
My father felt that if you look around the area, around here, most of the land is owned by small family farmers. And the last 20 or 30 years have been difficult for family farmers. And that was the primary reason why he became interested in trying to get a wind development project. We had lots of owners and lots of small tracts of land, and there was a natural resistance to doing all that contract stuff. But once I was able to convince the developers that uh, the actual construction cost on this wonderful flat farmland with county roads everywhere would be an absolute minimum, then they began to take notice and, and uh, was able to make this happen. You might could say I did it all single-handedly, see? I got caught in a cotton stripper in 1972. I was 30 years old. It really wasn't such a traumatic situation for me. I just decided that I was going to take it on as a challenge and uh, worked out OK. I've been very fortunate. I think that global warming is, is readily accepted and most farmers are good stewards of the land and they're wanting to see something done about it and contribute to it. Look at that. That's something. Before the turbines, things were bleak in Roscoe. When I graduated from high school, I mean, most of the people that, uh, that grew up here, they couldn't wait to get out of town and, and go to the big city. Not because they didn't love this area, but mainly because there were so few opportunities. For Roscoe, I guess we bottomed out when we lost our Dairy Queen. Oh yeah, that's the kiss of death for a small town. When your Dairy Queen closes down, you're, uh, you're on your last leg. But about that time, our wind industry came along, and it's been a fantastic, unbelievable boom to Roscoe. Roscoe's got uh, what will end up being, for a little while at least, the largest wind farm in the world. And there are 400 landowners in this area that are sharing in the benefit of that project. The landowners get paid on the actual amount of electricity generated. Their payment is a straight royalty, and this is the only time they've ever had a chance to receive a steady income. Once it's completed, Cliff's Wind Farm will power 250,000 homes, and the farmers are raking in up to $15,000 per turbine per year, leasing their land, which is still usable for farming and ranching. The thing that's really cool, you talk to a lot of the families that raised kids here and you find out that a large percentage of them have children moving back to this area because of the wind industry. Vicki uh, uh, Haynes really benefited from this wind farm. I hope, uh, hope you'll include her. She's a lot better looking than I am. This is our daughter and our little grandson that it brought home. And my son-in-law and our little grandson. So Dan's the one working with the wind turbines and it's just been a blessing. Farmers really do appreciate these things. This is strictly dry land. We sit here and pray for rain and cuss the wind. Now what we've been cussing all these years turned out to be a blessing. It's clear wind power reduces cussing in West Texas, but in many other states, people don't like wind turbines or the transmission lines they'll need. That's too bad, because the U.S. Department of Energy says wind from Texas, North and South Dakota, Kansas, and Montana has more power potential than all the electricity needed in the U.S. If you look at wind's power potential worldwide, it has the capacity to produce trillions of watts, otherwise known as terawatts. All day, every day, humans are now using energy at a rate of 16 terawatts. And this runs everything. Cars, skyscrapers, ships, smelters, crock pots, everything. With electricity, fuels, cow dung, you name it. A terawatt is a trillion watts. A hundred watts powers a 100 watt light bulb. A kilowatt is a thousand watts. An average American household consumes 28 kilowatts of the terawatt pod. A billion watts is a gigawatt. Seattle or San Francisco eat up at least a gigawatt of power. 
A thousand gigawatts is a terawatt. And as soon as possible, we need all 16 of those terawatts to come from clean, climate-safe sources. We now power less than two terawatts that way. Getting to 16 terawatts will be a tough task. Let's say two terawatts will be made from wind power. We'd have to build and install one large wind turbine every five minutes for the next 25 years. Is that even possible? At its peak, General Motors could make six new cars every minute. And many car factories sit idle. Let's retool and build wind turbines. And check this out. Every day, 86,000 terawatts hit the Earth as solar power. Over 32 terawatts are pumping from geothermal power. And 870 terawatts of wind power are blowing around the globe right now. We only need 16. Although wind turbines are sprouting like mushrooms across the west, coal plants are popping up even faster in the east. In the next eight years in China, they're going to build 800,000 megawatts of new coal plants. That's two and a half times more plants than we have installed in the U.S. today. Although we are now neck and neck with the Chinese as to who is the biggest polluter, we should realize that in terms of what's heating the earth, what's up there now, it's 80 or 85 percent Western pollution. Now, the first challenge we in the West have is not to be smug. We have no right to say we should wait until they do something for us to do something. That's just wrong. Point number two is it is in our economic self-interest because if we don't get going, all the other countries are going to get going. There's no question that these technologies are going to grow very quickly. The question is who's going to get the business? We've already seen that U.S. has lost the solar business. Solar energy was basically commercialized in the United States. Now the biggest solar companies are in Japan and Germany. The biggest wind turbine companies, again, we created that industry, are in Denmark and Germany. If we don't get off the dime and start moving aggressively ahead to become the leaders in this vast, vibrant, new renewable energy field, China is likely to be there well ahead of us. Their automobile fuel efficiency standards are tougher than ours are, and they've got a half a dozen of the most vibrant, fast-growing solar photovoltaic electric companies in the world. What we need to be worried about is whether or not we're keeping up with them. My approach is to make America the country that gets respected, rich, secure, entrepreneurial and competitive by leading the world in clean power and energy efficiency, the next great global industry. The good thing about the green economy, the clean energy economy, the low carbon economy, it's a labor intensive economy. It will create an infinite amount of jobs. This is geostrategic, geoeconomic. It's the most patriotic thing you can be, do, think or feel today. Green Baby is the new red, white and blue. Climate change is, in fact, a national security issue. We need to change how we think about this. This is no longer the purview of Birkenstock wearing tree huggers. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Climate change is posing risks around the world. from the increasing risk of extreme weather events to sea level rise. As deltas get flooded worldwide, and there are a lot of very highly populated deltas, you can think Mississippi, you can think Ganges, you can think Nile. Uh, those people are gonna have to move. The world is not ready to accept all those refugees, so there are gonna be a lot of wars or nearly wars. And should they occur in some parts of the world where the United States has very significant presence and interest, you'll have a security problem that affects the United States. But there are closer in, more, more critical elements that affect security. Fundamentally, we all understand we've got to get off our dependency on foreign oil. The nations in the Middle East are more important now because of our desire for oil. If you take that out of the equation, then maybe the kind of spectrum of conflict we see ourselves in over there may change. 
President uh, George H.W. Bush would probably not have felt he had to protect Saudi Arabia from Iraq. The Persian Gulf had been home of two-thirds of the world's proven supply of broccoli. I was not a big believer in global warming, but you can only read so many reports, so much science. You know, I live in Florida, and I was going to say drill, drill, drill. But now, as I know more about this, I think that if oil is the problem, maybe more oil is not the answer. At 300,000 barrels a day, the Department of Defense is one of the world's biggest users of oil. Getting that fuel to the front lines is incredibly expensive. In dollars, but more importantly, in blood. When you're moving large convoys of thin-skinned vehicles transporting fuel, our enemies clearly understand how critical that is to us, and that is what they will attack. We have to find ways to, as, as one Marine general likes to say, unleash ourselves from the tether of fuel. Then the military won't need to fight over oil and the warfighters, as you can imagine, really like that idea. Current Green Hawk and career badass Dan Nolan headed up a task force to figure out ways to reduce military oil use. Early on, we wanted to understand what was the real problem, what was the real challenge. And so we went out, we started visiting some of the forward operating bases, the FOBs. A third of the Army's wartime fuel use is to run generator sets to make electricity. In a typical forward operating base recently examined, 95% of that electricity went to air condition inefficiently, tents sitting in a very hot, sandy place. If it was 120 degrees with the air conditioning blowing in there, you might be able to get it down to 100 degrees. And really what we're doing is we're air conditioning the desert. So we're getting people blown up in fuel convoys to deliver the fuel to be wasted in that way. Just connect the dots, and obviously there's something wrong with this picture. We looked at uh, what was currently available in terms of uh, adding liners to tents and that sort of things, and then uh, one of the folks on my team came up with the idea of spray foam insulation. This looks like a tent. The only difference, it doesn't move at all. Essentially, you've got a big Eagle cooler here. By foaming tents, we go from a 50-ton cooling unit down to a 8-ton cooling unit, which reduces our power consumption tremendously. We figured that within approximately 10 months, we will pay for everything. So we're actually saving soldiers' lives, giving them a more comfortable place to stay, and saving money and saving the environment all in that one fell swoop. Beyond tents, quickly constructed buildings that use no fuel are on the horizon. What we're in right now is a monolithic dome that has its own power. We have two wind turbines and two solar panels. The goal is to get continuous flow into the batteries inside. What we really don't have right now is utility level power storage. That, for me, is the holy grail. If the Green Hawks get the DOD to invest in large scale battery technology, they could help jumpstart an industry. When the first microchip came out, it was very, very expensive until Uncle Sam started investing in them, and those prices went down, and it became commercially viable. We could use the government's buying power to make these systems more accessible on the commercial market. Our mission in uh, protecting our nation includes protecting our environment. And sometimes outside society follows in the footsteps of the military. Harry S. Truman ordering the integration of the armed forces helped kickstart civil rights in the 60s. It's all those soldiers who lived with people of different color and race, you know, in the military went home and it changed their communities. When the military goes green, the country's going to go green. But right now, even as the Green Hawks' ranks are growing, the entrenched bureaucracy of the DOD is pushing back hard against innovation. 
It's going to take many more bold military leaders and brave lawmakers to give this lasting traction. For years now, we've been hearing about climate change as some far-off event. Finding solutions was smart, but we thought we had time to figure things out. Trouble is, there's no more time. The evidence is piling high that climate change is happening right now. The consequences of climate change are being acutely felt in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. Warmer winter temperatures, which they've got, cause more precipitation to fall as rain, not snow. More winter rains mean water becomes storm runoff instead of slowly recharging the groundwater as snowmelt does. Less snow means glaciers aren't replenished. All this adds up to wasted water in winter and droughts in summer, lowering the output of Washington's main source of electricity, hydropower, and greatly reducing the numbers of salmon as well. In the last 60 years, 53 glaciers have disappeared on the northern Cascades. Glaciers are also retreating in the Sierras, the Rockies, the Alps, and the Himalayas. Hundreds of millions of people and thousands of industries rely on that water. As the country gears up for a green tomorrow, a major place of change is on the road. The world's transportation runs on carbon-rich fossil fuels. Lessening the thirst for fuel comes in many shapes and sizes. Planning cities so people can walk, ride their bikes, and take mass transit is a great start. Loading trucks more efficiently, using only one engine when taxiing planes. Even tacking a sail on cargo ships all reduce carbon dioxide, which from cars, trucks, trains, planes, and ships adds up to about 14% of all the world's CO2. And as more and more fuel is needed across the globe, using fuel more efficiently is key. I'm a truck driver. I'm out on the road 10, 11 hours a day, seven days a week. I try to take at least a day off here and there, see the family, stop by the house, see the bills that they're piling up. I run from uh, California all the way to Texas. You run in temperatures between uh, 95 to 110 degrees. And the coldest, four days ago, the temperature was 24 degrees. To run their air conditioners or heaters while they sleep, the truckers have to keep their engines running. We were burning about one gallon per hour, even if it's during the winter or during the summer. So we idle, I mean, sometimes up to seven to nine to 10 hours. So you basically are losing uh, dollars. You're losing dollars every time that truck is running and not moving. A solution to this is the external power unit, which cools the truck with a tiny bit of battery power and heats the truck with one-tenth the fuel. You can sit there and get frosty. You can lay down and get frosty. <laughs> My heater's over here that works together with this unit. Hot air will start popping up from the bottom of that vent, and it'll start getting everything nice and warm. I'm able to conserve my fuel, then I can travel longer distances without sitting there idling nine to ten hours, you know, burning, you know, nine, ten gallons. This nine, ten gallons is going to give me X amount of mileage. You know, it adds up. So, yeah, there's somebody's vacation right there. <laughs> we don't know about the world, but if all long-haul truckers in America shut their engines off while they slept, they would reduce CO2 emissions by 11 million tons and save more than one billion gallons of fuel a year which is over one-fifth the Department of Defense's fuel usage. Fuel efficiency is critical, but we also need options other than fossil fuels. Automobile companies are starting to say, look, we want to sell you the cars you want. Sometimes they'll be big, sometimes they'll be fast, but we're going to power them on something other than petroleum products. One replacement for petroleum products is biofuels. Now, I'm somebody that owns ethanol plants in America, corn-based ethanol plants. Corn-based ethanol plants are, are nowhere near as efficient as sugar-based ethanol plants. For every acre of sugar, you can produce seven times more fuel than, than one acre of corn. 
A big drawback to ethanol is that it can't be refined into diesel, the world's principal transportation fuel. Nor can it make airplane fuel. Ethanol freezes at 15,000 feet, and therefore um, it's not a good idea for planes to have ethanol. We are still in a world that runs on combustion engines. There's over a million man hours of just engineering work in a modern jet engine. That's not going to disappear tomorrow. So something's got to feed those jet engines if we want to continue to move around the world. Uh, we're looking for renewable, sustainable methods for doing that. There's a promising biofuel that uses no food sources, is homegrown, and makes both diesel and airplane fuel. If you look at fossil fuels, uh, the bulk of the carbon that we're burning now was algae derived. The beauty is the algae is renewable. On top of being renewable, a clear advantage over fossil fuels, a pond of algae is highly productive. If I grow an acre of corn over the course of a year, and I take the, that piece of land and I plant as many crops as I can in 12 months, the maximum yield that I'll get out of corn from an oil standpoint is about 28 gallons. If I do the same thing with an acre of palm trees for producing palm oil, I'll get somewhere between six and 800 gallons. If I scrape that acre of land off, put a shallow pond in it, without any technology, just an open pond, I can get as high as 5,000 gallons of oil. The promise of algae is tantalizing. Like many new green technologies, it's expensive now, but could become cheaper once pilot projects grow to big time operations. Another way to get the oil monkey off our backs, use electricity. First automobiles were electric. Then because of the oil was so cheap and the batteries weren't ready, they very quickly moved over to gasoline. We've been doing it one way for the last hundred years, but now we've got to be thinking about what's the technology for the next hundred years. And personally, I believe it's electrification of transportation. This is a very complex high-tech operation. You take the extension cord, you plug it into the car. <laughs> All you have to do really for this is to put in the lithium-ion battery, which is about 10 times more powerful than the regular battery in the car. Although these batteries are not quite ready for mass production, untold teams of researchers worldwide are honing in on the solutions, like making them last 10 years and ensuring that they'll be recyclable. The overall goal is less emissions with less expense. You're talking about being able to drive at something close to 10% of the cost of what you're driving at now. Now, you don't have to be concerned about climate change or terrorism or anything to want to drive at 10% of the cost of what you're driving at now. The net emission reduction for CO2 is better for plug-in hybrids no matter what you're using for electricity. Even coal plants produce less emissions through a plug-in hybrid than gasoline does in an internal combustion engine. Certainly if you're using wind and solar and renewable energies, you're getting an enormous reduction in emissions. Pacific Northwest National Laboratories has done a big study, and they say you could have 85% of the cars on the road be plug-in hybrids before you need a single new power plant. Plug-in hybrids could also solve one of the grid's major problems. Utilities have no way to store electricity for when they need it. We've got to build power plants to meet, relatively speaking, a few hours, a few days of the year when demand is at the absolute highest. And for the rest of the time, we've got this excess capacity. But with the advent of plug-in hybrids, this excess capacity could be socked away in their batteries. When we're in a power crisis, and it's a very hot day, and the air conditioning load is high, and we're looking at having to turn on more fossil fuel plants, then you could sign up to say, my car's plugged in. It's sitting at work. Use it as a tiny power plant. And imagine millions of those power plants being able to feed back into the grid, and we avoid contributing to the carbon problem because you stored it up. And if the utility wanted to use your plug-in hybrid for electric storage, you could say, beg me and then pay me. If you go into a dealer's showroom in a couple of years and the salesman says, the local utility, uh, we're working on an arrangement with them, but it looks like within a year or so, they may be picking up about a quarter or so of your annual car payments. 
<laughs> What's not to like about that, right? <laughs> What's not to like is the patchwork of laws that govern utilities across the country. In some states, or even counties, it's against the law for people to sell extra electricity they generate to anyone but the utilities. And there's no law that says the utilities have to buy that electricity back. To change all that, it'll take courageous lawmakers to put country first and big utilities second. Or this great program could stall out, even while climate change is revving up. In Alaska, climate change has already shortened winters, which means late formation of sea ice, the strong barrier between coastal villages and the violent Bering Sea winter storms. As the exposed soil is much softer than sea ice, the village of Nutuk, with 340 residents, is losing 80 feet a year of coastline. Their barge landing, the main source of incoming goods, is gone, as is their dump. Their freshwater supply is next to go. They've got to move nine miles inland. The cost, $130 million. Four other villages are also designated imminently threatened, with 184 more on deck. 600 miles away and still in Alaska, there's a team fighting climate change with an untapped energy source that saves money, clears the air, and even warms your bath. We're at Teen Hot Springs. I'm Bernie Carl, and uh, here's Bert and Ernie. There are goats. <laughs> Alaska has more geothermal energy than all the states put together. But yet, Chena Hot Springs is the first geothermal power plant in the state of Alaska. Gwen Holden is Bernie's chief engineer for energy projects. I'm pregnant with uh, twins right now. That's right, six months pregnant. Gwen's main job with Bernie was exploring the potential of the Chena Hot Springs themselves. What people were saying was that the 165 degree Fahrenheit water that we had wasn't high enough for generating power. Your typical geothermal plant is operated at 250F or greater. So you're lo really looking for very hot water or even steam. I knew that I could make electricity from this water. And I brought in a drill rig and I started drilling a well over here. Before long, Bernie and Gwen did a successful test. At the same time, way back in Connecticut, giant manufacturer UTC Power was working on the same solution. We needed 165, 200 degree water. When you go to Chena Hot Springs, there's 165 degree water coming out of the ground. That's where Bernie Carl comes in. Now this power plant is making power off of water that's not as hot as McDonald's coffee. We developed lower temperature technology, so you don't have to go after 300 or 400 degree water or steam. This is working. We're doing it. I mean. The lights are on right now geothermally. Now we're going to enter the largest ice structure in the world to be up all summer. Now Forbes magazine voted this the dumbest business idea of the year. Mr. Forbes can kiss my ass. This entire structure is kept cold geothermally. It cost me about $12 a day to refrigerate this place. If you did it on diesel fuel standard, it would be $750 a day. It's the cheapest thing going. Our electricity was costing us 30 cents a kW. Right now, we're at 5 cents a kW. In three to four years, we'll be one penny per kilowatt hour. We'll have the cheapest energy in the state of Alaska. People say, where do you stand on global warming? I said, well, if someone thinks there's not global warming, then they must have their head up their ass. I said, if you pull your head out and open your eyes, you'll notice the glaciers are melting. You will notice that the sea ice cap is almost gone. So do you think there's global warming? Yes, there is. Do I think man is causing global warming? I think that we add to it. Do I think we're causing it? No. But that doesn't make any difference. I want clean water and I want clean air. And that's so simple. Usually what I get is people say, well, why hasn't this been done before? I don't know. I have no idea. If I can do it here, maybe it'll catch on to the other 230 villages in Alaska. And maybe if it catches on there, what if it starts catching on in the towns? What if everybody caught on? 
What if they did it because it made sense in their pocket? What if they had more change at the end of the day for being responsible? What about that? Climate change may be hardest on the oceans, where hundreds of millions of people get their main source of protein. Off the coast of Oregon is a dead zone the size of New Jersey. Thousands and thousands of Dungeness crabs, sea worms, and sea stars have died because oxygen levels are so low. Pockets of oxygen-depleted seawater have long been common far offshore, but with a combination of climate change-induced fluctuations in currents and winds, the most severe low oxygen conditions ever observed on the West Coast are now plaguing marine life. Climate modeling predicted what has become an annual occurrence since 2002. Scientists have no idea whether this is reversible. Energy efficiency is getting the services you need, like a cold beer or a hot shower or a comfortable house, using as little carbon generating fuel as possible. Energy efficiency starts with buildings, which account for about 40% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than double that of transportation. And that's because we use a lot of fuel oil and natural gas to heat buildings. We use electricity to light them and cool them. Currently, a bit of this electricity comes from renewables. But a big chunk comes from natural gas and nuclear. Nuclear power splits atoms and opinions. Proponents tout its ability to produce massive amounts of non-carbon energy. Opponents have distaste for radioactive waste, potential for rogue nuclear bombs made from that waste, and the enormous cost for new nuclear plants. There is disagreement on whether nuclear power is a must in tackling climate change. But right now, one other energy source has the lion's share of the market. We're looking right now at a U.S. electricity business that's about 50% coal. And the fact is, coal is the dirtiest fossil fuel. There's no debating that. It is absolutely the dirtiest fossil fuel. Nobody has figured out on a large scale, a commercial scale, how to strip out CO2 from the emission stream. And more importantly, haven't figured out where we put it if we strip it out. Home Depot has a wonderful program. They funded the planting of 300,000 trees already and are planning on funding more. And as a tree grows, it sequesters carbon. Ed and I started running the numbers and we were shocked. A single medium-sized coal plant in 10 days of operation completely negates those 300,000 trees over 100-year lifetime. So that was a real eye-opener and kind of made us sick to our stomach, to be honest with you. So Ed and Christina formed the nonprofit group Architecture 2030. By 2030, most buildings will be new or renovated. They say if we urge lawmakers to raise the bar on efficient building standards, making all those new and used buildings super low energy users, we won't even need coal by 2030. And all it will take is to ratchet up the technology we have in hand. If we were to shift to the most efficient lighting technologies now on the market, we can cut electricity use worldwide by 12%. That would enable us to close 705 of the world's nearly 2,400 coal-fired power plants. If every New Yorker swapped out all of the light bulbs in his or her apartment for CFLs, we could run the subway system on the savings. Gotta love this commute, huh? These are beautiful. So bright. Kind of feels like we're on a prairie here with the grasses behind me. A lot of Illinois species. 
but we're actually 12 stories above street level. We're on the roof of City Hall, and this was our first experience with a green roof. The temperature on a green roof is about 80 or 90 degrees in the summer, whereas the temperature on a black roof can be up to 160, 170 degrees. I can feel the heat emanating from this other black roof over here. So bringing that temperature down on the roof surface makes it easier to air condition inside, but it also keeps the ambient environment around the building cooler, which re reduces air conditioning costs for your neighbors. We calculated that if we can reduce the temperature in the city by one degree, we can save $150 million a year on air conditioning costs. As effective as green roofs are, there's something even more valuable and cheaper, too. I'd like to see what color the roof is. It should be white in this climate. We have a lot of coal being burned in power plants to run air conditioners to take away the heat that wouldn't be in the buildings in the first place if they had light colored roofs. Besides cooling the earth by reducing coal use, white roofs also help cool the earth by reflecting sunlight, making up for the ever decreasing amount of sea ice that used to reflect sunlight. By the time you got all the roofs white, you would be cooling the earth equivalent to having grabbed 24 billion tons of CO2 out of the air, which is equivalent to capping global warming for the next seven years. It's, it's huge. Architect Bob Fox and company have added up a few energy efficient benefits of their own in the Bank of America building. We're using about half the energy of a typical building of this size. We're using half the potable water of a building this size. We did spend uh, a lot of money to put in the green components of this building, but all of it has a very short payback period. So it's not what does it cost to do a green building, it's what does it cost not to do it. New York City has great new buildings, but 85% of the buildings that we will have in 2030, we already have today. And so if we're really going to make a dent, we've got to do some retrofits. I would like to see some of the effort transferred into installing real efficiency for low-income people. Many of these apartment buildings are just dreadfully inefficient. And the whole thought of taking gas and simply blowing it out uncalked windows is enough to make one cry. It's bad economics, it's bad carbon, and it's worse for poor people. I see the United States having almost a full employment economy based on retrofitting, rebooting a nation. When you renovate a building, you're not going to take that building, ship it overseas, renovate it, then ship it back. You're going to renovate it on site. We're going to have to weatherize millions of buildings. That's thousands of contracts, millions of jobs, billions of dollars beginning to flow in a positive direction to help the United States go from being the world leader in pollution to the world leader in solutions. The Empire State Building is old. Uh, it has a lot of complicated details and old systems. Yeah, the building is, is up for some major technical renovations anyway, and instead of doing uh, a normal renovation that makes it nicer but not more efficient, we can do both at once. We're here at the Empire State Building today, and our goal is to make this building the most efficient building it can be. We're talking about putting a shelf that would reflect the sunlight onto the ceiling into the space so that it would be reflected down deeper into the space. The breakthroughs in one area can drive further breakthroughs in another. We're here to change the rules. For example, if we dramatically improve the building envelope, then we can dramatically downsize the mechanics for cooling and heating. That means, by the way, I pay for a smaller cooling plant. I've saved money. And my tenants who pay for the operating expenses of the building will have a lower occupancy cost. Depending on what choices are made, we can save about 38% of the energy and make it a lot more comfortable and healthy and productive to work in, give it higher real estate value. And I think if we can do such a great retrofit in the Empire State Building, nobody else has an excuse.
Remember those 16 terawatts? Five could be knocked off the list with our new friend, energy efficiency. The cheapest, fastest, and cleanest way to let coal stay in the ground and out of the air. Nothing that we recommend in the form of energy efficiency costs money. It all saves money, so that's a rich field to mine. It's like a Saudi Arabia under our cities. Energy efficiency is a no-brainer, but because it's free to emit CO2, making carbon-based energy artificially cheap, energy efficiency is still routinely ignored. Besides buildings, that's a huge mistake in the industrial world. In the industrial setting, what happens is lots of industrials are throwing away really, really hot gases that they haven't recaptured as power because they're not in the power business. And at steel mills, you'll see these big flares. One plant over in northern Indiana takes that heat and makes 95 megawatts of power. And that's one mill in northern Indiana. And the amazing thing, if you stand on top of this mill, is you look around the rest of northern Indiana, you can see flares. Just look around and say, oh, you, you can do another one there, you can do another one there. This electricity made from wasted heat is one-third the cost of the steel mill's regular electricity. And if we made use of all waste-to-energy opportunities, world CO2 emissions would be reduced by 12 percent, maybe more. I don't know of any bigger opportunity to make more money reducing more CO2 than this one. So if you don't give a damn about the environment, do it because you're, you're a greedy bastard, you know, and you just want cheap power. Cheap power for most means less power needed. Refrigerators under the Energy Star program are now one half the price and use one quarter the energy as their 1975 models. The real trick today is how we get rid of the old ones. This is very typical of the average fridge we pick up. The utility companies have hired us to go out to customers' homes pick these things up, verify that they work, bring them in here, and recycle over 95% of the materials that went into making. Refrigerators are really bad, bad environmental time bombs. CFC 12, which is in the cooling circuit, that's what people typically call Freon, is 10,720 times greater a global warmer than CO2. We suck out the oil, and the refrigerant, and we do that simultaneously. Then you take the polyurethane foam, which is in the insulation. In this refrigerator, you have 2.5 tons of CO2 equivalent just in the insulation. We did all this wonderful milling and heating and all that. What we wind up with is Freon R11, or CFC11. That is doomed for destruction, and that's what we do with it. When I was 20 years old, I started producing uh, rock and roll concerts. I did everybody from Elvis to Sinatra and two tours with the Rolling Stones. Everybody goes, well, how did you go from rock and roll to refrigerators? And I said, it was, it was quite easy. It involved a jetty. <laughs> right after I did Rodney Dangerfield's U.S. tour, I went surfing after a hurricane and I hit a jetty and I actually died. I drowned and they brought me back to life and I decided that I better do something different. As I'm out there going underwater and I'm uh, going somewhere else, I said, you know, leave me on Earth and I'll do something good for the world. And you know what? It was a life-changing event. <laughs> okay, these are uh, grease monkeys, it looks like. Hi, Wade. How's it going? Good. Every refrigerator we pick up in this program is like taking two cars off the road for an entire year. 10 tons of CO2 equivalent. My father was an inventor. In fact, he invented the styrofoam ice chest. And some of his cohorts were actually the people that were responsible for polyurethane foam being used. So my father was responsible for putting those things out there. And I got to go clean up their mess. The mess we're giving our kids to clean up strains the imagination. In the states along the Rocky Mountains, later and warmer winters are having a devastating effect. Hundreds of millions of pine trees have been killed by the tiny pine beetle. Once held in check by the now disappearing winter cold snaps, the beetles have much more time to ravage. 
in Helena, Montana. The Kildaw Forest surrounds the town. And unfortunately, the cost of clearing the timber, which they have to do, and then milling it, is more than the beetle-munched wood is worth. In the western U.S., over 24 million acres of pine trees are dead. And since trees help cool the air, it's looking like their loss could heat up the interior west even more, which could really hurt the water supply, agriculture, and tourism of an already stressed-out area. Right now, tomorrow too, Earth is on the receiving end of 86,000 terawatts of solar power. Solar panels and towers aren't cheap, yet. But sunlight is free for the taking. The excitement in solar right now are the forests of mirrors in the desert that collect solar energy, boil water, spin turbines. In that sense, it's a very traditional electric generating technology using the heat of the sun instead of the heat of burning fossil fuels. A drawback to big solar in the desert is having to string up city-bound transmission lines through protected lands and national forests. Popping photovoltaic systems on the rooftops sidesteps this snake pit. What is so great about this rooftop project here is that the electricity goes right to the grid. This will create energy for 165,000 homes. And what I like about it, to put this rooftop on, created jobs. It proves that you can protect the environment and protect the economy at the same time. Because of these giant projects, coupled with local and federal tax breaks, the cost of solar is going down for homeowners as well. And for the communities where solar is still too expensive, Van Jones has dedicated his life to helping folks afford the panels by focusing on the people installing the panels. That's, that's Richmond right there. Tough. Tough, scrappy. You keep barking. That's good. <laughs> I was driving back from Marin County, and again, I've been like a spirituality retreat, you know, you know, <laughs> so, you know, like not something that my community and people I was dealing with was really in interested in. And I was driving back over the bridge, and I'm thinking, I'm going back to Oakland, you know, I'm going back to pollution, cancer clusters, and I just had this, this thing in my mind, and I just said, you know, we need green jobs, not jails. Those four words, four syllables, have just totally turned my life around, because, you know, that's, that's what I'm about. Grid alternatives is like the habitat for humanity of the solar industry. They are trying to get solar panels up in you know, low-income communities, people who need them. We do the installation for free, and then the homeowners finance a portion of the equipment cost with a low-interest loan that they get from the city. I want to make sure the wind don't blow my money off the roof. So we won't put it in unless from day one they're going to have savings. If it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so you gotta, that's right. Grid Alternatives, they're making sure that the low-income people who need the solar panels can get the solar panels, and then Solar Richmond makes sure that disadvantaged people get trained to do the work. So it's a two-for-one. So uh, how long like, have you been a part of this program? Uh, this would be my 10th week. 10th week? Is, is it good? It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Oh, really? Why you say that? Because, you know, it's a lot of, lot, of, lot of stuff that's going around. Just negative? Yeah, negative stuff. A lot of times, you know, these guys, you know, they're on probation, they're on parole. You know, the probation officer just, you know, assumes the worst about them. And then when they see them blossoming and doing something positive, even they were getting choked up. This is more of a way you to branch out, you know, get ahead, get a job, you know, provide for your family. See, a lot of times when people look at urban communities, what they see is deficits. They see what's not there. And when I look, all I see is assets. I see, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, visionaries, geniuses, hustlers, you know, and that's what we need right now, some visionary genius hustlers. <laughs> and now I could be the owner of my own company in like, you know, four or five years, six years. You know, just by starting at the bottom, you got to start somewhere to build up to the top. So if you want to have a green economy, it's got to be about reclaiming stuff. It's also going to be about reclaiming people, reclaiming neighborhoods. That's the green economy. 
Yeah, Usually when I was working, I never thought about my son and about the future. Now I can think about the future and my son when I'm working. So I'm working for a cause now. Like Daryl, Van also had a little motivation. Besides meeting the younger Jones, we met the man who showed Van what working for a cause was all about. As my father would say, are you reaching back? Are you helping somebody? Are you throwing a rope back down? My dad had an impossible task of you know, trying to fix a, a school. And they gave him five years. He, he did it in one year. I was a principal. Uh, they gave me Jackson Junior, of course, which was <laughs> supposed to have been the, uh, the worst of the worst. Worst of the worst. And we turned it around where it was the best of the best. You hear my father's story. It's just so, uh, so hopeful. That's how I feel about the country. That's how I feel about this whole planetary crisis. I, I know the ending. I already know the ending. And it's, it's so amazing to think how discouraged people are and they don't believe you can do something. Mm -hmm. And then you show some leadership and have some hope and you bring out the best of people. I don't have the answers, mm -hmm. but I know people do have the answers. Nobody's told them you can do it. Right. Nobody's asked them. You solve it. And, 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 and that's how you lead. That's how I lead. <laughs> <laughs> it's the people that nobody's heard from that are going to solve the problem. I just think, come back maybe in a few years, and you'll be able to see solar panels all over. <laughs> now the power's going to be going out, and the money's going to be staying in the house. That's what, that's what this is all about. Mother! We're helping with the, with the environment now. We got the right kind of light bulbs, and now we got solar paneling on the roof to reduce the energy bill. Yeah. We're making energy. We're sending energy to the energy company now. We're oh, saving so money right now. Who gonna get my shit? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> Come look at that at the meter. Clockwise is this way, right? That's when it, you know, you're using up power. This is going counterclockwise, so it means we're feeding power into PG&E. What's funny, This is the future. It's a place for ordinary people to earn some money and for low-income people to save some money. That's going to be the green economy to save the world. All of these clean energies and energy efficiencies cut down carbon emissions in huge numbers. Together, they combat four-fifths of man-made CO2. The other fifth of carbon emissions comes from the burning down of rainforests. That's right. One-fifth of all human CO2 emissions are from deforestation to clear land for farming, cattle grazing, and expanding cities. And whether the carbon is from a coal plant in Indiana or a raised rainforest in Indonesia, it heats the planet exactly the same. Every year we destroy enough forests to equal half the size of California, or Oklahoma and Maryland combined, or eight Vermonts. So protecting rainforests is a big deal on the carbon frontier. But what we learned next was a real kick in the gut. Even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, the Earth will still continue to heat up because we've put too much CO2 up there already. If you could split the atmosphere into one million equal parts, you would see that very few parts would be made of carbon dioxide. That's why scientists measure these tiny yet powerful amounts of CO2 in parts per million. The safe level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is around 350 parts per million. We are currently at 387. And that means that we really have to get down to zero emissions during this century and we have to be well on the way by the middle of the century. And secondly, we've got to suck some stuff out that we already put up there, and we've got to get on that path sooner rather than later, or we will pass this point of no return, this tipping point beyond which we can't actually fix the problem. Things will spiral out of control. 
If we haven't already passed the tipping point, most scientists believe it's fast approaching. Once the booming economies of Brazil, Russia, India, and China take off, CO2 levels could easily get to 550 parts per million or higher by 2050. And when 350 is considered the safe threshold, and hey, even if you consider 450 a safe threshold, 550 is horrifying. Permafrost melts, releasing massive amounts of new CO2 and methane, seas 20 feet higher, a billion people without fresh water. It could happen. If we do nothing, you can bet on it happening. But there is a solution. If we trust our planet's five billion years of research and development and work in concert with nature, the land could revert to what it does best, taking airborne carbon and storing it, sequestering it back in our forests, farms, and pastures. First, we've got to stop burning down the trees. A couple solutions. In the Amazon, a major cause of deforestation is to clear grazing land for beef cattle and farmland to grow soy to feed the cattle. If the meat eaters like myself go meatless just one day a week, it would reduce not only huge amounts of CO2, but also the powerful greenhouse gas methane, a byproduct of cow burps. Second, Ecotourism. When people who live in or next to rainforests make more money protecting them, the rainforests stay. In addition to forests, farms hold vast potential for grabbing CO2 out of the air and storing it in their soil. But alas, most conventional farmers have yet to jump on the sequestering bandwagon. Generally, a conventional farm is set up more like a factory. The soil is the factory. Farmers buy inputs, whether they're seeds, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and they bring those into the factory, the soil, and they have product going out the other end. The problem with that system is it's based on a, an industrial model. And we all know that every factory and every industry wears out. But when the soil wears out, we're in trouble. But in organic farming systems, we're improving the soil and the health of the soil while we're using it. One of the pieces that we're beginning to understand about what happens in the life of the soil is mycorrhizal fungi. It is a fungi that will attach itself to the root hair, and it creates a symbiotic relationship with the plant. The mycorrhizal fungus is the main mechanism by which carbon accumulates in the soil, not for a season, not for tens of seasons, not for hundreds of seasons, but up to thousands of years. These mycorrhizal fungi flourish in organic systems. They're not as prevalent in conventional systems. So chemicals inhibit their growth or sometimes like fumigants will kill them. Another thing that kills the fungi is leaving fields fallow. What we happen to know here in our research is, is one of the best things you can do is put in a winter cover crop. What's really important about this is it leaves a place for this mycorrhizal fungi to stay alive and grow. And when we do that, we can literally sequester over 1,000 pounds of carbon per acre per year. But the other really important piece to this is cover cropping greatly reduces the capacity for that soil to erode because you have crop and root there to hold it in wind or rain. There's a lot of carbon in soil. Preventing it from eroding not only keeps enormous amounts of carbon from being released, the resulting carbon-rich soil would retain water in drought, absorb water in flood, and produce healthier food. This is the beauty of what organics gives to the world. It's actually, as I like to say, it's biological. It's a regenerative approach to farming. It's a regenerative approach to taking carbon dioxide out of the air and building soil health at the same time. Naturally grazed grasslands can also reverse erosion and potentially sequester huge amounts of carbon. The best soils are always produced naturally under tall grasslands. I'll show you some of my favorite grasses. Here they are. This is a bunch grass. The cows love it. It's an ice cream plant. 
which means that they will choose it over everything else. The grass co-evolved to be trampled, chewed, and left alone. If you bite off the top of the plant, that much of the root dies back. I'm sure every plant's a little different ratio. But in that die-off, all this material that has now been kind of abandoned by the plant is food for the mycorrhizal activity, the bacteria. That is how soil gets built down there. The cow's manure also vastly increases a healthy grassland's ability to sequester carbon. But many grasslands are not healthy. Many of our soils have been mistreated and through compaction, either from animals, humans, or from machinery, develop what are called plow pans, which are very thick, compacted layers of clay that cement together and don't allow the roots to penetrate deeply in the soil. And the roots are the major plant organ that is associated with soil improvement and carbon sequestration. So the carbon farmers slice through the compacted soil allowing the grass roots to grow three to eight feet, bringing tons of carbon down deep. We want to be having so much carbon sequestered that we actually have to hire people to burn coal to get <laughs> carbon dioxide back up into the atmosphere because we went too far. And I see this as our version of a victory garden. The whole world can do. If we can achieve a major shift in managing grasslands, forests, and farms, then these natural land use practices give us the potential to draw down 39% of mankind's current CO2 emissions. Now this is new science to be sure, but the early numbers are tantalizing. Over the next 50 years, these game changers could reduce atmospheric CO2 by 50 parts per million. In our dirty little hands is an unheralded solution that could help lead us back to the safe level of 350 parts per million. If all these solutions are such great ideas, why haven't they happened yet? Because clean energies are at a disadvantage. Carbon emissions are causing climate change, which will cost trillions of dollars to combat. Yet emitting carbon costs nothing. Now, there's a powerful option for getting energy efficiency and clean energy to expand from less than two terawatts to all 16. We've got to find a way to give a common set of incentives to people to reduce the generation of greenhouse gases. The most efficient way to do that is to put a price on carbon. That can only be done artificially by government intervention, which means a bigger government hand on the economy, because the problem's not going to go away otherwise. So, you know, we, we shouldn't think that this problem will be solved by running out of coal or gas or oil. It will be solved by addressing the emissions from coal and gas and oil. We need a powerful market signal that will tilt the whole system away from where it is today, where pollution is free and everybody says, hey, we'll just pollute, to a whole new ball game where pollution no longer is free. In fact, it's more and more expensive, and anybody who's intelligent is going to start polluting less. Putting a price on carbon, which is now tepidly being tried in Europe and the US, is critical. The devil is in the details of how these carbon laws are written. We'd bore you to tears with cap and trade versus carbon tax debates. But either way, an effective place to focus is on carbon-based fuels at the source. There's only a relatively small number of companies, oil companies, coal companies, natural gas companies, who are bringing carbon into the economy. We can make those suppliers pay for every ton of carbon that is in the fuels that they supply. And as the price of carbon goes up, dirty technologies become more expensive, and it opens up a space for clean technologies to come in and compete. So whether a price on carbon happens soon or down the road, forward-thinking companies are already moving ahead as if carbon cost them money. And they're finding out it actually does. The Walt Disney Company has created an internal carbon tax, making all divisions pay for emitting carbon. Their carbon tax inspires employees to use less energy, emit less carbon, 
create more profit. Since 1994, Dow Chemical has spent $1 billion on energy efficiency. So far, Dow says it's earned more than $9 billion in energy savings. And for the folks at Stonyfield Farm, the world's largest organic yogurt producer, it's become clear just as existing buildings need to be retrofit, existing businesses need the same. We've found that we're actually turning our operation inside out by empowering the folks throughout the business to drive out waste, to drive out excess carbon production. We had to build a waste treatment plant because we had exceeded the capacity of the local wastewater system. So the team actually came up with an entirely different approach that traps the gases that are being created by the waste and that gas has actually been used now to actually operate the facility. And so they took something that was a cost center and a pollution center and turned it into a profit center, which means this thing is now making me money. The transportation team is an even better example here. They've reduced over 6 million trucking miles. That's a 60% carbon reduction. These teams together in the last three years have generated $7.8 million of profits for my company. That's $7.8 million that translates into 46 new jobs. And so even through the recession, we were growing jobs. So there's nothing that makes more sense from an economic point of view than reducing your carbon footprint. So let's say making economic sense is the goal. Then the real work begins. Intensifying energy efficiency standards. Making clean energy cheaper than carbon energy giving the Pentagon's Greenhawks a megaphone, completely changing our land use practices. This is going to be an engineering, political, and industrial revolution. Don't think big, think huge. I think what we have to understand is that we're looking at a World War II level of mobilization. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, FDR said, we're not going to sell any more private cars. We're going to make the planes and the tanks and the whatever we need to do to win this war. With planes, for example, the goal was to produce 60,000. People were very skeptical because no one had ever seen arms production numbers like that before. And in the end, we produced not 60,000, but 129,000 planes. The key point there is it didn't take decades to restructure the U.S. industrial economy. It didn't take years. It was done in a matter of months. If we take that same level of enthusiasm, interest, and focus in trying to come up with sustainable initiatives and renewable energy sources, there's no doubt in my mind we can achieve that. When we look back at World War II, we think of the greatest generation. Tackling climate change calls for extraordinary generations. Let's get a look at uh, Weston over here. Solar panels. You put solar panels on? That's the easiest way right now. Wind power isn't very feasible in this area because there's rarely enough wind. Other than been developing, it's the sol um, wind turbines, which run on lower amounts of wind, where instead of the traditional blades, it's a cylinder shape with propellers on it, so it spins horizontally instead of vertically like this. One thing's for sure. The new generation is ready to take the reins to harvest the 16 terawatts of clean, climate-safe sources. From 86,000 terawatts of solar, 32 terawatts of geothermal, and 870 terawatts of wind power. For the current generation, although some will need a bit of prodding, there are a number of leaders as well. We need more, many more. That's the, that's the shot right there. That's it. They're putting the panels in. It's exciting. This is what, I, what I've been working for, praying for. I wish my dad were here to see it. Well, he, uh, my dad passed away in, in May. And um, he... Uh, great man. So... So anyway, I'm doing this for him and for my son. And it's, uh, this is a, 
the most beautiful scene in the world. Right here. <laughs> It's a unifying cause to address the climate change problem. Ultimately, I think it could be uh, one that reminds people of our common humanity. We all agree that there is some aspect of it that we can embrace, the environment, the economy, or national security, and we can all move forward together with it. All these crises uh, uh, have set into motion something good. People want to, to turn the ship around. And that is what we have to rely on. The people awakened can do miracles. And that's what we need, that's what we're gonna get. When Gamesa first decided to locate its factories in Fairless Hills, what was here was a rusted out shell of a former U.S. steel facility that had been left fallow for 15 years. Then they refitted it and actually brought jobs in as opposed to outsourcing, which I really appreciate, and put a lot of steel workers back to work. Jim Bauer worked for U.S. Steel, and he was absolutely impacted by the Rust Belt phenomena, and he lost his job. It's a big happening in your life to be all of a sudden found to be out of work and trying to support the family and kids going to school. It's tough. I worked in a building next door that is actually on the ground right now. They're in the process of knocking it down right now. Am I supposed to be smoking on film? My wife sees this. I'm in trouble. I worked 
All where you see that scrap, that's actual building and my cranes are laying on the ground chopped up and it's kind of sad, really. It's been 25 years over here. Maybe Gomez will build a wind turbine plant on this side, too. This spot right here holds a very special spot in my heart. Right there. <laughs> I fell over right here and had a heart attack. Actually, I looked up at this tower and everything got real mellow. And now I'm looking up at it again and the wind's blowing real good and I still have a hell of a future ahead of me. Our plant here last year produced about 500 turbines and we have created over a thousand jobs. And it's a story that can be recreated throughout the United States and that's what this is all about. We built the first major offshore wind farm in the UK. My day job is I have to make money for my business, but it, it just does not get me out of bed, frankly. And one of the best antidotes for that that you know, I've found personally, you know, get out in a boat and you look up at this thing. It goes beyond, well, we actually made X million pounds profit last year, so we did that. And the feeling that that brings is just infectious. You want to do more of it. There's a piece just standing here right now, particularly if you weren't here with that camera. <laughs> How about if the camera wasn't here? <laughs> you know, if you weren't here with that camera, if I was here by myself, okay. just standing here, sitting here, just leaning up against that tree, it's, it's a feeling I don't get very often, I put it that way. I haven't had very often in my life.